Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. It's so, so nice to see everyone on today. Uh, we just got some very new things we got to tighten up on and, and knowing where we're going at this juncture right now. Um, right now, I want to say as a chair of the Law Enforcement Accountability Task Force, and in accordance with the passage of House Concurrent Resolution 1, adopting the rules procedures for the General Assembly and its legislative committees during an emergency, this public body is authorized to meet virtually. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen conference proportionally. We are utilizing Zoom webinar for this virtual meeting. All members of this task force can communicate synchronously on the platform. Should any task force member experience technical difficulties, please call 302-744-4351. The public may participate by registering via the meeting link that is posted on the General Assembly's website. The, pu the public can also view this meeting via the live stream that is posted on YouTube. A link to the live stream can be found on the General Assembly's website. Should the public be unable to access, access the meeting, the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. Instructions providing, provi providing public comment will occur during the public comment during this meeting. Please note that any votes that may be taken shall be done by roll call vote. Let's begin today's meeting by taking a roll call attendance of the task force members present. Remember, task force members shall ensure that their cameras remain on for its entirety of the meeting to the best of their ability. When your name is called, please unmute your device and affirm your attendance. Once you've been recorded as president, please mute your device for duration of the roll call. Rep. Cook, present. Darrell Parson. Here, present. Chief R.L. Hughes. R.L. Hughes is here. Larry Johnson. Representative Ruth Briggs King. Senator Brian Pettyjohn. Present. James Liguori. Spencer Price. Kathleen Jennings. Attorney I, am, I am here. Good morning. Good morning. Superintendent Melissa Zebley. Present. Kevin O'Connor. Present. Michelle Taylor. Bernice Edwards. Ron Handy. Cherise Brewington Carr. Present. Good morning. Good morning. Lieutenant Thomas Bracken. He's excused. Lieutenant Frederick Calhoun. I am here, sir. And Chief Patrick Ogden. Here. All right, we do have a quorum. Let's start off with our agenda. Has everybody had a chance to read it? We were sent out. Uh, a minutes. Does anyone have any changes? A motion to approve? So moved. We have a second. I, I'm unclear on what the minutes are. There were three attachments, but none of them clearly said what the minutes were. Representative Cook, if I could interject, it is the document labeled 51321. So it's a little bit of a shorter um, format than usual, um, but it has the transparency and accountability recommendations that we voted on in the last meeting. Thank you. Chief Ogden, Chief Ogden. Yeah, 
that's fine with me. I just, you know, they weren't they weren't labeled as minutes, so I wasn't sure what what they were. And these and these recommendations seem to be just from the the accountability and and or the transparency and accountability uh, section of the task force. Is that correct? Yes, sir. You are correct. Um, basically, I, if you don't remember what happened in late April, we ran out of time. So those were the remainder of the recommendations. Got it. Thank you. We had distributed the previous set of minutes at the last meeting. So sorry about that. Thank you. I'll, I'll second. Thank you, sir. Okay, can we take a roll call vote on the minutes? All right. Uh, Representative Cook, yes. Darrell Parson? Yes. Chief R.L. Hughes? Yes. Larry Johnson? Representative Ruth Briggs King? Senator Brian Pettyjohn? Yes. James Liguori? Spencer Price? Kathleen Jennings? Yes. Melissa Sebley? Yes. Kevin O'Connell? Yes. Michelle Taylor? Bernice Edwards? Ron Handy? Cherise Brewington Carr? Yes. Lieutenant Thomas Bracken? And Lieutenant Frederick Calhoun? Yes. And Chief Pat Ogden. Yes. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, some updates from me. Uh, I have on workforce development updates. I have uh, Cerise Bruinton Carr. Uh, I'm gonna let her take over on giving us an update on her workforce development and what is uh, we're trying to do. Ms. Bruinton Carr. Oh, thank you, Representative Cook. I didn't realize I was speaking today, but I'm happy to talk about where we are and uh, the advancements that we've made thus far. Good morning again to everyone and to the members of the public that might be with us. Um, the Workforce Development Committee, as part of its recommendation, uh, which was supported uh, when we last met, was to conduct a survey uh, for the frontline rank and file, as well as civilian members of police forces throughout the state of Delaware. That um, proposal has been submitted uh, and we wanted to gain support from the police chief's council. And we have got that in support. Thank you so much, Chief Ogden and Colonel Zebley and members of the council in regards to that. So we're looking now to move forward with um, seeking support and also uh, financial support for getting the survey done, as well as um, uh, looking forward to the process. So that's what I have to report at this particular time. So we're extremely excited about that opportunity to talk to this really important and critical key stakeholder group about um, their concerns and or issues, and as well as to be able to further, again, tell the Delaware story about law enforcement in the state of Delaware. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have any, any, any of the members have any questions or any state? Okay, since we don't have any, I'm moving on to the use of force recommendations. There were recommendations approved by the use of force sub subcommittee meeting that occurred after our last meeting that needed to be voted on and they are posted online and were attached to the calendar. Uh, the Attorney General, Kathleen Jennings, will discuss the recommendations before opening discussion among the task force members and the use of force subcommittee recommendations. Attorney General Kathleen Jennings, the floor is yours. Thank you, Representative. Um, and once again, good morning, everyone. The use of force subcommittee during our May 14th 2021 meeting uh, voted with overwhelming support on a list of eight recommendations regarding standard statewide use of force policy. 
The detail um, is in the attachment uh, to this meeting, but overall, what I can say is that there was um, overwhelming support that, first of all, there should be a statewide use of force policy for all police agencies in Delaware, that the standard policy should include key provisions such as de-escalation, um, shooting at a moving vehicle, dealing with individuals with behavioral or mental health uh, crises, uh, a duty to render aid, a duty to intervene, and a duty to report excessive force. The uh, task force or the subcommittee, excuse me, also um, recommended that we give consideration to the New Jersey use of force policy, which had been issued in December of 2020 and other best practices in force throughout the state of Delaware already. Um, it is our recommendation that the policy be developed by the Council on Police Training and that there be public engagement on the development and implementation of this policy. The policy should be coupled with significant training uh, that is uh, hands-on and reoccurring and that there be sufficient funding for all police agencies in this state to properly train um, police officers on use of force. There were additional, um, what I will call proved consider approved considerations uh, that uh, we have attached. They were not part of the actual use of force policy itself, but the uh, use of force subcommittee recommended that there be a racial impact statement for all use of force policies, that is um, so that it can be tracked in terms of the occurrence of a use of force by among other things, race. And that there be data kept on the numbers of use of force uh, and that they be reported publicly. There was also uh, due consideration recommended to be given to expanding access to mental health crisis services to support law enforcement in their efforts. And once again, to require ongoing training specifically related to de-escalation, crisis management and conflict avoidance. That Mr. Chair is uh, in some, the use of force subcommittees, as I said, overwhelming support uh, as detailed in the report. I think you're muted. I'm sorry, thank you. I surely was, <laughs> I should be used to this by now. Uh, are there any, any discussions, any questions? Uh, I have a question, if I could. Martin Carr. Thank you. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, the question I had is, I wonder if you could speak, it's been a while since we um, looked at any of this, and I'm just wondering if you could give some specificity around the New Jersey use of force. And I have a couple of other questions as well, but if you could basically give us some detail, um, you know, to the extent possible so we can better understand what you feel is, um, should be, extrapolated model, um, you know, in terms of their use of force policy. Sure. And, and um, we also at the time had the Attorney General from uh, New Jersey speak at our use of force subcommittee and present the policy in its entirety. I think of particular um, interest among the use of force subcommittee was the detail in the policy, the requirement of ongoing training, all of the detail that I've mentioned about duties to intervene and report, uh, but perhaps most importantly, there was a very robust policy on shooting at moving vehicles. Um, in Delaware, as you know, the Attorney General's office has historically and continues to investigate all police involved fatal shootings. And we have uh, gathered statistics about those. It, it appears that roughly a third of those shootings do involve shooting at moving vehicles. And we felt that it would be meaningful to provide the police with 
um, very specific action items if if they're ever in that situation, heaven forbid. So, um, so that was a particular concern uh, by the subcommittee that we have the, that kind of detailed policy. New Jersey has it. Of course, there are other model policies out there and other states with equally good policies, uh, including our own Delaware State Police policy, et cetera. But we didn't feel that we should hamstring anyone in uh, developing this policy. The Council on Police Training, they're the experts and the policy should be developed by them. Understood. I guess the thing that I think about when you reference it in your recommendations as written, it implies that it is the New Jersey policy in totality. That's why I asked about, you know, the specificity in what particular area and wonder if you would be willing to amend uh, in, in, in the spirit of the discussion within your committee specifically to talk about elements of it that's related to what you'd like to see adopted in Delaware policy versus saying it's New Jersey policy, use of force policy in and of itself. Sure, I think, uh, and I, I think I'm understanding your question, um, Ms. Burlington Carr, but the feeling among the use of force subcommittee was that New Jersey policy should be considered by the council on police training uh, when adopting their own policy, because first of all, it was adopted recently in December of 2020. Um, the New Jersey Attorney General has command authority over every police department in the state of New Jersey. And so it has to be followed by every police department in the state of New Jersey. So without sort of limiting what the Council on Police Training should do, um, because as I said, there are other good policies out there. Um, we would just ask that the Council on Police Training duly consider this policy in particular. And I believe that the policy on shooting at moving vehicles was of particular interest to the use of force subcommittee. I, Have I answered I, your question? I'm I, trying to. Well, I, I understand. It's just, as it's written, it just concerned me a bit. So that gives me a little bit more clarity versus you know full adoption. And the other question that I had too is that um, when you talk about dealing with persons in a behavioral or mental health, you, are you still also considering aspects of various policies or best practices as it relates to that? Are you saying there should be mandatory inclusion, duty to ensure that there is inclusion in the policy? Can you give some more specificity about exactly what you're thinking as it relates to that? Because you're <laughs> saying dealing with persons, so I'm not sure what that means. Sure, there was a great deal of discussion among the use of force subcommittee about the concern that, <laughs> excuse me, several, several use of force incidents, as we know, both in the state of Delaware and nationally, involve people in a mental health crisis. And so it's, it's exceedingly difficult for the police, I think, to arrive on a scene um, where there's a mental health crisis at play. We saw that most recently in a shooting in Milford, Delaware, um, where the person was both in a mental health crisis, but extremely violent. Uh, this individual had uh, threatened to kill police, indicated that, um, you know, the police were his target, so to speak, and then walked out of his uh, apartment with a knife in his hand, lunging at a police officer. So, so that it's really hard for us to say, well, in every police involved situation where there's a mental health crisis, it can be averted because that's just simply not true. Um, there are those situations where police are put in harm's way directly. And when they walk into a situation, they know it, it has a high propensity for violence to occur. And so that's why um, the consideration of utilizing mental health assistance where feasible comes into play. For example, I know the Newcastle County Police received a grant in the last several years, I know, because I was I was working there at the time uh, to have a mental health counselor 
accompany police on certain calls um, because the expert would be in the car who could help calm the situation down. So it's all part of an effort to deal with the mental health issue as long as it's safe to do so. And beyond that, I don't think anyone on the use of force subcommittee felt that they should craft the actual policy. That should be the council on police training, but there should be consideration given to mental health crises. And I think major police agencies in our state are doing that. Just two more quick points. Um, as it relates to the racial impact statement and also the uh, reporting of, um, I guess, what is it, the excessive force, is that report and impact statement speaking about not only the, um, the accused uh, or person involved, but also the officers that are involved yes. in terms of the impact statement or the, the demographics? Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. And the last thing you made a mention about um, uh, resources, financial resources and what have you. And I know, you know, no one wants to qualify that, leave that to, I guess, perhaps maybe our, our great folks in uh, the Office of Management and Budget, um, but just a little bit more specificity around that and in your recommendations, I think would, would help or direct or imply directly that there's expected that there will be resources that are required um, and an analysis that should take place in terms of what those costs should be potentially and how they can be shared equitably, particularly when we're talking about universal use of force policy across the entire state. Um, maybe it's resources towards the police council, um, council on police training. I'm not sure what that might look like, but to make sure given the diversity in law enforcement agencies across the state that there's equitable application where needed. That's a very good point. Ms. Brewington Carr, I'm really glad you brought it up because as you know, we have over 40 police departments in the state of Delaware, some large and some quite small. And it is really unfair to ask of the smaller departments um, to do the necessary training themselves. It's virtually impossible. It's also unfair to ask, for example, the state police to do all the training um, with, with their budget. So it's important that there be sufficient funding for for the training to be done the right way. And that requires uh, an overall statewide effort to make sure that that funding is in place for all police agencies. And I don't know if Chief Ogden wants to comment on that. We haven't quantified it yet, but you know, it has to be there for this to work. Yeah, so I'm in favor of just about everything on here. In fact, I, on my website, I have all my use of force uh, back to 2016 to include, I just want to talk about the fields real quick. Date, time, incident, crime uh, investigated, type of force, whether it was a display only, uh, whether there was an arrest, the suspect's age, race, and sex, the officer's age, race, and sex, and if the officer or suspect was injured. So I'm, I'm all for that level of transparency. The, the one thing I just, I'm listening to the conversation I don't understand is what is the racial impact statement? What, I don't understand what that means. What are we gonna, I don't, I mean, I, I get, get that we should include race in the statistics, but I don't, I don't understand what they mean by a race impact statement. And that's why it's an additional consideration because it is a bit unclear, but I think that what you said um, just now is clearly within that construct that the race of the individual, the civilian involved, and the race of police officers gives us some information that not all, you know, we don't have uniformly. I know that in the University of Delaware Police put it up on the, the website, as you said, um, but it's not uniformly available. And that's helpful to us because while the Attorney General's office investigates and tracks that data, currently tracks that data for all police involved fatal shootings, it is not done sort of uniformly throughout the state or reported. So, so my question would be, uh, 
Attorney General, what, so what do you mean by when you say it's unclear? We're putting something in somewhere that's unclear, and you even said it's unclear. What, what do you mean by that? How can we clear it? <laughs> well, to me, racial impact statement means exactly what Chief Ogden just said. Um, I think to go beyond that isn't a matter for the police at all to, to deal with. So a racial impact statement would be exactly what I just said. But I would also say that these Additional considerations do not directly pertain to a use of force policy. I want to make sure that that we're clear on that. Okay, Sharice Brunton Carr, floor is yours. Yes, thank you so much. So, so to um, Chief Ogden's point, because when I looked at that, it it is a bit. Um, uh, broad when you talk about racial impact statement does it in does you know you know how would the data be used um you know where is it shared you know those kinds of things and one of the recommendations that we had uh, that was approved in the workforce development committee was to look to the model that they use um at the university of delaware we liked that in that we thought that that was a great way to capture and to analyze um data that uh related to the accused persons who were involved, as well as the officer uh, gender. It was very specific and it gave um, uh, demographics we thought needed that would ultimately inform uh, potentially uh, a racial impact statement. And so I think it means different things to different people and it needs to be, um, uh, have some more descriptors as it relates to what, what exactly we're looking for. Understood. Yeah, I mean, we have an opportunity. We're a small state. We have an opportunity to just uh, use the Police Foundation Public Safety Open Data Portal that's intended to be a clearinghouse uh, for accessing and visualizing and analyzing lo local and national law enforcement and public safety open data sets. I, I think that, uh, you know, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's something already in place. I've been using it for years. You know, I think that's something that, that we should consider. And that way we have that same level of uniformity we can't have one department collecting statistical information one way and another department doing it another way and that's exactly chief what i i believe that we were trying to accomplish which is to have a uniform statewide data reporting that included race all right Hughes, the floor is yours Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to point out that I wanted to echo some of the concerns from Ms. Brewington Carr, specifically around the, the bullet item with um, New Jersey and best practices. It seems, I, I do take pause with the fact that we name a particular state. If we're, going, if we're going to do best practices, then let's just do best practices. And if New Jersey happens to be the best one of the best practices, then so be it. But I, I think it's too specific. So I did want to put that out there. And as far as the additional considerations, is this, so do we as a body need to vote to even consider the additional considerations? Because they seem to be a bit, a bit uh, quite vague, uh, in my opinion. Um, the funding issue is very much um, at the heart of this for, unfortunately, it's a reality that we need to really take a look, hard look at funding. And so there needs to be funding made available. The consideration of expanding mental health for law enforcement, I am all in. However, how does that impact what uh, Representative Longhurst is working on in a committee that in the work task force that she has moving forward, which I think is getting ready to publish a report if it's not already been published on that very same topic. So you know, we, need, we need to make sure that there's collaboration among the different task forces out there. And I will echo Chief Ogden, the, the original recommendations, they're, they're good except for the New Jersey piece for me. Mr. Hughes, I, I am hearing you. I am just telling you that the use of force subcommittee believed that New Jersey had a very compelling policy and that it should be specifically considered by the Council on Police Training. It does not require that the Council on Police Training adopt anything in that policy but it was a recently enacted policy. It covers every police department and every police officer in New Jersey. And the use of force subcommittee was quite impressed with 
the specificity, specificity contained in that policy and recommended strongly that it be, quote, considered, end quote. It does not require our state of Delaware to enact what New Jersey enacted. Um, it simply requires consideration. Hughes, or anything else? No, no, I've stated my point. Fred Calhoun, the floor is yours. Uh, yes, ma'am. I have some question about the use of force stuff you talked about, the mental health of shooting at cars. Do you, do you have a policy that you envision being in place? I'm assuming that some of the recommendations from your office are based on a case that you would handle, I, I would assume, and trends you see in Delaware. Uh, what do you envision those policies or uh, there's policies being, I know the mental health, I, I, you know, when I was president, I was pushing the mental health issue really heavy because of the impact it's having on law enforcement. I saw the trend coming across the country and that does concern me a, a, as you addressed in the case down South, that is starting to happen more often than not. And we are, now that I'm retired, I can tell you that police officers aren't really equipped to handle those types of individuals. You know that you've been in this business for a long time. Uh, so what do you envision uh, that policy being, um, or do you have an idea of what you would like to see in that uh, when it comes to fruition? Okay, so I think you've asked me two questions. One is shooting at moving vehicles. And this is not the attorney general's policy, of course. This is the use of force subcommittee's recommendation that uh, a uniform use of force policy include a policy on shooting at moving vehicles. So I don't envision what that policy should look like. It should be up to the Council on Police Training, except to say that due consideration should be given to best practices and policies throughout the country, including uh, New Jersey's, which is specific. Uh, but it does not require that at all. It requires the Council on Police Training to adopt a uniform policy statewide on use of force. In terms of mental health, um, the agency that you served in so, so well for so many years has, has done what uh, I believe this is, this is requesting, which is they have a mental health expert um, who is with vehicles uh, and can respond to a mental health crisis when it's feasible to do that. And public safety comes first. But you know there already is that practice in the state of Delaware in existence. And I agree with you, we, we expect far too much of police officers. They're not mental health experts um, and, and shouldn't have to be. So this is a recommendation that where possible and if there's sufficient funding, that we should give, give due consideration to uh, mental health crises in responses. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else for discussion? Rep Representative Ruth Briggs King. Thank you. Um, a pardon for joining you a little bit late, but we're also in joint finance, so I'm trying to be two rooms at the same time. Um, I agree with some of the um, other members' concerns about amending number three so that we remove reference to New Jersey, maybe combine the language in three and four into one good piece about uh, saying what we want the policy, how it should be developed, and, and so on. Another concern I had, though, was down under number six when we talk about standard policy being coupled with significant training and saying that instinctively comply because many things are reoccur are, are different now. If you've got a, a veteran officer um, has been trained one way to think instinctively and now we might be shifting that. And so I do have a concern with when we say instinctively because it's gonna be some, um, it's gonna be a while, I think, your instincts aren't just gonna change because we write a new policy. My law enforcement officers might do different, but if my instinct has been for, for safety or for one thing, and I'm shifting that, I'm, I just, I draw a pause when I think, how much training is it gonna take? and Experience is it gonna take 
to maybe overcome some of that other training or that other instinct that has been inherent for a long time. I, I'm just concerned when I read that. I think the emphasis representative is on the word training and that the training be recurring. Of course, that's not gonna happen on day one. Sharice Bruinton Carr, the floor is yours. Thank you. Just, just one last point. I agree with uh, Representative King as I relook um, number six instinctively always uh, challenges me because that's that's subjective and it's 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 individualized and we know that. Um, I'm back again to the racial impact um, piece of it. I think it needs uh, a bit of reshaping wording. Um, more specificity. And also, uh, as I reread it uh, one last time, it spoke to assessment by a, um, uh, an outside entity, and I'm not sure, a non-police agency per se, and if there was any implication um, or what have you as it relates to that. Um, I just think it needs some working to make sure that uh, in the spirit of what it is intended to do, that it helps to inform. And I wonder if you could speak a bit about the non-police agency, if there was any references or uh, suggestions or um, inferences, if you will, as to what that might look like. Sure. The discussion concerned the data being made public and then an independent agency taking a look at the data to see what it was telling us. Apparently, obviously someone who has experience in analyzing, in analyzing that type of data is that that should be said. Yes, that's, that's my recollection of the discussion on, these, on this particular item. Rick Calhoun, you got the floor. I forgot to take my hand down, sorry. Oh, okay. Anyone else have anything else? Any more discussion? I just want to, um, I'm listening to everyone here. Uh, I would like to, to make a motion that we take at least the New Jersey part off of the uh, number three force reference to what the recommendations are, and let it be our own, even though you, you had that in there. Uh, I, I would like to make a motion. Anybody want a second? Representative Bruce. I'll second that. Second. And, and as a member of the Council on Police Training, uh, and I'm sure the Colonel will back me up on this, we, we will look at the New Jersey policy. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. I, but I don't know that we need to specifically reference it in here, but we will we will look at the policy. At least I will advocate that we look at the policy. All right, let's let's take a, a vote on it on the motion. It's been laid out. Can you call can you representative? Can you call for the question and we discuss it just 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 a bit more? Um uh, in terms the of the recommendation, the Jersey, I, I think the motion is to take the New Jersey part. No, no, no. Oh, I'm sorry. No, it, no, no, it wasn't that. I'm, I'm in agreement that we we do that and that it be added as a compendium uh, for consideration within the police chief's council, which Chief Austin has already indicated they would. I am concerned about the languaging around um, the racial impact piece. So, um, you know, I'm not asking, I am asking for a friendly amendment that we get more specificity around what specifically that is stating. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I think we've got a we've got a motion. Motion a on the floor right to, now. To, to, we'll I'm only report. asking for the point of order, so I don't know what we need to do at this point. So that's why I raise it. We're in this discussion phase. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're in the discussion on the motion right now. So yes. I understand that. Okay. okay I'm, I'm, I'll make sure that we come back to that. Ms. Carr, Thornton Carr. Uh, voting. I say Frank Coke. Yes. Darrell Parson. Yes. Chief R.L. Hughes. Yes. Larry Johnson. Representative Ruth Briggs King. Yes. Senator Brian Pettyjohn. Yes. 
James Lagori, Spencer Price, Kathleen Jennings? No. Melissa Zebley? Yes. Kevin O'Connell? No. Michelle Taylor? Bernice Edwards marked from absent to present? Bernice Edwards? I was told she was here. Still absent. Ron Handy, absent. Sharice Brunton Carr? Yes. Thomas Bracken, excused. Fred Calhoun? Yes. <clears throat> Chief Patrick Ogden? Yes. Okay. It has passed. Now back to Ms. Brunton Carr. I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, Ms. Brunton Carr. Thank you. Um, I'd like to make a motion as it relates to the racial impact statement that it speaks specifically to the collection of demographics by uh, persons accused, as well as law enforcement uh, personnel, and that um, the reference to a non-police agency would speak to persons who have experience in analysis on racial data. We have a motion on the floor. Do we have a discussion? Second. Second by Representative Briggs, Briggs King. Am I right? Say so. Vote. I say yes. Frank Cook, yes. Daryl Parson. You're muted. Yes. Chief R.L. Hughes. Yes. Larry Johnson, absent. Representative Ruth Briggs King. Yes. Senator Brian Pettyjohn. Yes. James Liguori, absent. Spencer Price, absent. Kathleen Jennings. Yes. Melissa Zeppley. Yes. Kevin O'Connell. Yes. Michelle Taylor, absent. Bernice Edwards, absent. Ron Handy, absent. Sheratine, Sharice Brewington Carr, sorry. Yes. Thomas Bradford, excuse. Fred Calhoun. Yes, sir. Chief Patrick Ogden. Yes. All right. Motion passes. We have anything else from the committee? Alexa, I'm ready for, for public comment. Thank you. If you would like to provide public comment, please utilize the raise hand function or press star nine if you are on the phone. I'm just going to say it one more time. If you would like to provide public comment, please utilize the raise hand function or press star nine if you're on the phone. Chair Cook, it appears that there is no public comment. I just want to thank everybody for being here today. Uh, taking the time out of the busy schedule. It is very, very busy. I'll be glad we're ready to meet in person a little bit. Uh, I just want to say one thing. Uh, let's not us forget, you know, during our task force and during my task force from the, uh, the legislative Black Caucus, Delaware Legislative Black Caucus and the Justice for All agenda. I want to thank a lot of people here, but we must not forget, you know, Iman Umar Kaif Hassan L that was on this task force that unfortunately passed away while we were still on this journey of this task force. And I just wanted everybody just a little remembrance of him uh, representing the Muslim community, which I think in our task force, we had a little bit of everything here. And, and, I, and it's no about Frank Cook or my co-chair, Darrell Parsons. It's about all of us, because we're all human beings. It's about all of us. And, and this is very challenging, challenging for me at least, but. I think we did a great job and I'm like, I thank everyone from my heart for participating because that's the part that's hard, get folks to participate. And I think we did an outstanding job, but it's not from me, it's from you all to get it done. And I would thank the governor also for choosing this membership uh, and also those who participated in the house and the Senate. Thank you for, for getting us together. And this is something that we needed and we need to continue to tell the Delaware story. It is so important the Delaware story, and, and we need to continue doing this. And it takes all of us to work together, to compromise and get things done. Not only sit at the table, but service the constituents of the state of Delaware. Very, very important. So I just wanna thank everyone who has participated. 
After that, I know we're rolling. 1048 is not bad. Here we are. I know we got other things to do. So I want to say thank you to all. Have a good week. Thank you.